Robin Thede is the creator and one of the stars of a Black Lady Sketch Show. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Robin. And um, just to start off, we saw some cast changes from season one to season two, but I'm going to ask you about that in a little bit. Okay. But just on a, on a production level, though, what were the most significant changes that you had to make for this second oh. season? Oh, my God. Well, making a show during COVID, obviously, and at the height of COVID, right? So we shot from October to February with a break in the middle for holidays because I was anticipating there was going to be a big surge, and there was. Um, it seems like ancient history now, but we shot at the height of the worst part of the global pandemic to date. So um, it was nerve wracking, it was scary. It was, um, it took a massive effort on the part of hundreds of people. And, you know, we carried a nursing staff, like 20 nurses, plus a whole COVID department, another couple dozen people with us everywhere we went and we shoot on location. So, you know, it's really wild because at that time, if you remember people in LA, restaurants were closed and people didn't want productions working because we would set up food tables outside, but the restaurants would be like, well, we're not open. That's not fair. So there was a lot of that kind of like tension in the air in Los Angeles when we were shooting. So those were the biggest production challenges, but you wouldn't know it to watch the show. Season two yeah. is, if I may say so myself, amazing. <laughs> And I mean, I'm so proud of it. I'm just so proud of it. And what happened was we all really banded together to create um, a show that was full of joy because we were feeling so much of the sadness, you know, from the year that was going on. So it was really nice to come together. And in so many ways, shooting the second season kind of saved my life, I know, um, in some ways, or just my happiness. You know, it was like a place to go and to not... Um, think about the people around us who were getting sick and unfortunately, you know, some of them passing away. So it was, it was really um, bittersweet in that way, right. To, to have a year that was so hard for so many people, but to know that we were making something that was going to end up being um, such a source of joy. Yeah. A lot of joy for sure. But this season we, we saw the departure of Quinta, Quinta Brunson. No, not I the think... departure, just the pause. <laughs> okay, the hiatus, perhaps, because um, of scheduling, I think, just couldn't make it yeah, work. Yeah, it was just because of scheduling. She had other things to do, and so we yeah. got pushed six months. Gotcha. I mean, we're lucky any of the cast was available to shoot. Yeah. Um, and so Quinta's um, doing great. She's got a new show on ABC, Abbott Elementary, right. and um, and she's still with us and a part of the family. So we will see what happens in season three, scheduling-wise, but we all have every intention of being together. Um, and we'll see what happens. Um, so, you know, this is a show where I don't stop anybody. I don't keep anybody in these, um, you know, we make only a few episodes a year, right? So it's really important that they're able to succeed and do other things outside of this show. I would never stop my sisters from doing other amazing things. And I know most showrunners don't work like that, but for me, it's really important that, um, that they feel like this is their family and their home space to come play but that the rest of the year, they're still able to make a great living and have a great career. That's amazing. They're not locked into like a seven year contract. <laughs> they're locked into a contract, but- okay. <laughs> But still but have like freedom. When, when the yeah. scheduling conflict came up, I wasn't gonna stop her from, from doing right. anything, you know? Right. And so it was just unfortunate the way it worked out, but, mm -hmm. um, and I know that the fans miss her. We missed her on set, but, but we talked to her. I talked to her every other day. Like, you know, she's, she hasn't gone anywhere. She's still a part of this family. And, and, and we're so excited to, um, you know, just see what happens in the future. It's kind of like, you know, Maya Rudolph left the cast of SNL a long time ago, but she's on the show every, you know, every few months, you know? So it's just, it's just part of the same sort of family. And I know that's hard for fans at first, um, but I hope they can understand that it's because of my love for her. And it's because I would never want to stop her from, from doing anything else. Right. Well, two new members of the family came on board season two, Lacey and Sky, uh, Lacey Mosley and Sky Townsend. Um, what was it that made them right for this show? Yeah. Okay. So, so Sky Townsend actually got cast in December of 2019. We added her as a fifth cast member um, from the original four of us. Um, and so she had to keep this secret for almost two years. It was insane. And so she um, came on with us and had already rehearsed. We were five days from shooting when we got shut down in March of 2020. So she had to keep that secret uh, another year past that. And then Lacey Mosley, we added in the fall when we knew Quinta was going to have scheduling issues. So we um, added Lacey to kind of round out the team. Um, and she, they both came in and were just so clutch. Lacey's physical comedy, 
her uh, elastic face, as I like to call it. She can make any expression funny. Um, and, you know, UCB trained, really, really, really funny, versatile performer. And Sky is comedy royalty. Obviously, Robert Townsend is her father. She is a master of characters and voices and uh, is just so, so, so dynamic. So we were really lucky to get them in this season. And I think, yeah. look, every season can have anybody in the cast, right? It's a Black lady sketch show. It's not the Robin Thede sketch show or the Gabrielle Dennis sketch show or the Ashley Nicole Black sketch show or the Quinta Brunson sketch show. It's it's a Black lady sketch show. So any of us, um, um, you know, we want we want this to be a home for Black women, Black women comedians who who want to come play. So, um, you know, look in in subsequent seasons, I think that'll become clear. But I know. Um, change is tough for people who were so <laughs> locked into the specific cast for season one but yeah. I think we'll just continue to grow and expand and people will come in and out and play and and we'll always have this amazing environment where we can do that well you also had a lot of great guest stars this season just like you did for the first season um did you have a guest star in season two that just totally exceeded your expectations in terms of how they integrate into the show I mean I, I have one in particular that do I okay, thought was fantastic your? Honestly, Amber Riley just totally like. Oh, she's amazing. <laughs> she's such a pro. Yeah. She's done four sketches with us, and she's yeah. she's the most guest starred besides Issa. Uh, yeah. But Issa is not a guest star. She's part, you know, she's an NEP and part of the family. But um, yeah, Amber Riley is just clutch. We had her in two more sketches this season. Had her in two last season, and yep. she's just playing new characters and new types, and and she's she's limitless. And I I feel so lucky that she comes to play with us. A lot of the season two guest stars were me just texting people that I know and saying, please come do the show. And we were the first show for a lot of people, for Amber, for Tyler James Williams, for Gabrielle Union. We were the first show that they shot during COVID because uh, we were one of the first ones back. So they trusted us to take care of them. And, and we never had a single shutdown day on set. Um, we never had a COVID outbreak. I know a lot of shows had issues with that, but we kept everybody safe. We tested multiple times. Our poor guest stars had to get tested three or four times before they even set foot on say, on, on the set. But um, yeah, I think Amber doesn't surprise me because I know what she can do. I think Jesse Williams surprised me how funny he was, um, but he's such a good actor. I wasn't surprised to see that. Gabrielle Union didn't surprise me because I've known her for a decade, but um, I think she may have surprised some other people and reminded them how funny she is um, in the Black Table Talk sketch. And we've been talking about doing that for like a year and a half. So I was so excited about the way it worked out. And actually, here's a scoop for Gold Derby. Dwayne Wade was supposed to come in the flesh and be in that sketch. <laughs> and at the last minute, he was shooting um, his other show, another one of his other shows. So he couldn't come and we got that cardboard cut out of him. And honestly, I, it worked out way better than if he would have been yeah. there. Just telling her to be quiet while we waited for him to talk was so silly. Right. <laughs> well, I definitely wanted to highlight that sketch in particular because you just have this fantastic recurring character in Dr. Hadassah um, pre-PhD of course. Thank you Dr. Hadassah <laughs> yes. Olyinka Ali Youngman pre-PhD still has yet to get that PhD and if you We're think about it, it everyone is pre-PhD which is what's so genius about that phrase. That is true. Pre I'm pre-PhD. I'm pre-PhD. Yeah, pre yeah very relatable. Super um, silly. Super silly. But, yeah she's, she's amazing. Yeah. I love the line where Gabrielle Union says she's a breadwinner and Dr. Hadassah says that white people got you thinking bread is a prize. Um, oh no, white people got you thinking bread is a prize. Yeah, that, I mean, it's it's really ridiculous. And she uh, is appalled at everything Gabrielle says, which is kind of the game of cat and mouse in that sketch. It's just like, she's trying to, the, the whole thing about Dr. Hadassah, for those who haven't seen her, is that she is a hertep, which is the female version of a hotep, uh, which, you know, is somebody in our comedic version of this is somebody that we interpret as somebody who kind of spouts conspiracy theories and that kind of stuff about the black community, the white community and everything in between. Um, so her whole point is that she's trying to educate people while remaining supremely uneducated. So she is in this uh, sketch trying to start a school uh, but has no credentials and just kind of has a pamphlet and Venmo's uh, Gabrielle Union for $58,000. <laughs> and Gabrielle Union says, you want me to be a part of your pyramid scheme? No, thanks, you know, which is really funny. So um, yeah, it's super fun. It's super fun to bring in these guest stars because you just never know what you're gonna get. But the good thing is they come so ready to play. 
Um, I mean, we had Omarion, Lazalonzo, Miguel, like all these amazing guest stars this season. A lot of guys this season. Right. Um, and like Omarion shocked me. I truly didn't think he would. I don't, well, we knew he would be great, but he was like doing off camera. He was doing impressions and characters. And I was like, oh my God, you're like really good. So um, I think singers, something about singers makes great guest stars because Patti LaBelle was so amazing. Oh, yeah. Omarion was so great. And Amber Riley, right? She's a singer, mm -hmm. but she can morph her voice into anything. I think that's a really good um, key. And all the women in the cast, except for me, are singers. So all of them. So um uh, you know, I think that that does help when they are when they're creating characters and impressions. And for me, I've just always been a mimic. I've always been a like, that's how I always created the hundreds of characters and impressions that I do. I just always used to sit in front of the TV as a little lonely kid and mimic every voice on TV. It's how I learned how to do uh, Jet Kay's character from 227. It's how I learned to do like a news reporter voice. And so it's always funny how sketch performers kind of hone that craft and we all kind of have different ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, just speaking more broadly to the show, um, I mean, so many sketches are just funny on their own, but also a lot of them do have a commentary to them about these specific situations that, you know, especially Black women faced in the world. And I'm curious when you're writing a sketch and you're just starting out, do you go into it thinking like, this is what this sketch is going to say in terms of commenting on this situation? Or is it more like, for example, like, let's set this in biblical times and then we'll just let it snowball from there? No, there's a lot of planning that goes into it for sure. Um, mm. And you're right. Some of the sketches have more of a like allegorical message that we want to get across. It's very clear. And some of them are just a good time. Like, you know, yeah. the black lady courtroom, which is called courtroom Kiki uh, is just a good time, but it is kind of a message about when black women who are really professional enter a space where you don't normally see other black women, like them trying to ride that fence of, of being professional and doing their jobs, but also being really excited that they're around each other. So um, but you mentioned biblical times and my favorite sketch from season two, hands down, is the Last Supper. Um, it's a sketch where basically the women disciples that you didn't know about are forced to sit at the kitty table behind the long table of the, love, the Last Supper. And Holly Walker, this amazing writer performer who I hired back at the Nightly Show and who came on this show with us for the first two seasons is now writing on Sam B. She's unbelievable. And that was her idea. And uh, she wrote the mess out of that sketch. And then we improvised a lot too. So there was kind of that larger feminist, um, uh, you know, through line about uh, what it would look like for women disciples. And, and then the, the sketch itself is really a game of monologues. If you think about the three women at the table, they all have such distinct personalities and wants that they're really just talking to themselves, even though it seems like a dialogue. Um, so that's, that's a really fun game too. There's always kind of multiple levels of games in all the sketches. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also a bit of an experimental edge to the show that I always find really engaging. And, you know, you're not afraid to go to some more surreal places sometimes or even scary places and go yeah. a little darker. Um, why does that kind of surreal kind of tone interest you in terms of comedy? Yeah, I think what people don't realize is they're always like, it's only six episodes, but our show's 28 minutes long. And most sketch shows are about 19 minutes. So we're giving you, you know, almost double the content. I'm, my math is terrible, but we're giving a lot more content. It's like there's 10 episodes in six. People don't think that because it goes by so fast and that we work really hard to keep the pacing up. I mean, no one has ever said a sketch was too long, even when we have a seven minute sketch, because it's a narrative sketch show. We have full beginning, middle, twist, and ends. You never know where the sketch is going to end. And um, so, the, so the, the definition of the show is a narrative sketch series where Black women are living grounded experiences in a magical reality. So part of that surrealism and that um, the, the latitude to get darker is kind of in the definition of the show. We want to tell stories and introduce three-dimensional characters played by black, black women, but they can be anything, right? They can be murderers. They can be clowns, they can be judges, they can be lawyers, they can be doctors, they can be just regular girlfriends. But the point is that we're gonna play with, we're gonna play with genre and narrative um, all the time. So um, like for even the Last Supper sketch, we said when we were planning it with our DP and our director, we said, okay, we're gonna layer on the visual look of succession on top of this sketch to really give it a really dynamic feel. So every layer is thought about from the writing to the wardrobe, hair and makeup, to the way we shoot things, to the way we edit. So for the darker pieces, there is it's really fun for us because we get to play with horror and sci-fi and dark comedy genres um, in a way that's 
kind of subverting traditional narratives of those of those genres. You don't always hear about comedy being um, also horror. I mean, Jordan Peele did it really well with Get Out. But um, but yeah, we like to dive into those different genres and sort of parody genre versus parodying like pop culture because we make the show, you know, nine, 10 months before it airs. So, you know, we can't really compete with shows that are doing it day and date. So for us, the way we keep the show varied is to play with the visual style, the aesthetics, the characters and the tone and the genres. So it just leaves a room open for us to be able to do anything and play in any sandbox, which I think is the magic of the show. Yeah. Well, speaking of playing with things, I wanted to talk about the opening credits, ah. which um, I think I noticed around the third episode that there was something a little different about each one. <laughs> <laughs> where basically you're, you're in these rooms and with each episode, there's something that goes wrong that involves yeah. one of the cast members. And then the last episode is just like all of you kind of terrified to be in these boxes and asking for help and looking for a way out. Yep. Can you talk about just how you developed that idea and to slightly tweak the openings for each episode? Yeah. So this season, I knew we needed a new open um, uh, once we had made, you know, some of the cast changes for season two. So um, I wrote this, um, I don't know, in like a day because we were already in production. So um, I knew we were going to shoot opening credits. I don't think I actually wrote it. I think we we're in the middle of production. It wasn't in the original show packet. We, they were like, are you going to tell us what the opening credits are going to be? I'm like, mm, eventually. But I was waiting till I got the right idea. And I love a different world. And we always do an homage to some sort of show that from our childhood, we did 227 in the first season. Um, and second season, this was, I knew this was going to be my kind of homage. So we actually ended up building these sets. We normally shoot everything on location, but we ended up building these sets with our amazing production design team, Cindy and Michelle, and some construction vendors that we, we love to use. And I knew it was going to be um, a morphing storyline in the opening credits. And I wanted to make sure that people watched and didn't skip them. I think some people are just realizing, though, that the credits aren't the same. I love The Simpsons, right? I love how the last little vignette of The Simpsons open is always different. So for me, I was like, okay, we're going to be in these rooms. We know that the ultimate, spoiler alert, we know the ultimate crux of where we're going narratively with the interstitials this season is that someone's watching us in this warehouse that we've now found ourselves in at the end of the world. So we wanted to really have a sense of doom and darkness. And even though these rooms are really bright and it looks like a different world, that surrealism and that dark comedy comes in and that horror element, because we wanted to show that we were trapped, like you said, that something was going on. And, and that's why we're in our interstitial outfits in the opening credits as well because I wanted to dovetail that with what was going on in the interstitials. So each week in the opening credits, someone accidentally gets murdered. <laughs> um, but it's not our fault. We're just trying to like go through the room and play double dutch and like dance on people. And then we end up killing them every week. And then at the end, we find out, and there are people in these masks. So they may or may not be human. There's kind of this fucking with our minds sort of thing that's going on. Um, by the people or persons or entities that are watching us. I can't tell you who it is because we don't answer that question in season two. Well, I will in season three though. Um, but, um, and then yeah, at the end in the finale, we end up being trapped in the rooms and not being able to get out. Um, and we're just kind of like, what is happening? And then similarly at the end of the interstitials, we open this old laptop that wouldn't turn on that's mysteriously delivered to the warehouse and then it turns on by itself and we see profiles of each of us as if someone has been has been keeping records of all of us and pictures of us in the warehouse so they're currently watching us right now so i'm excited to show fans where that will go in season three but that's the great thing about the show you really get two shows in one you're going to get five or six right. sketches every episode that are going to take you on these journeys but you're also going to get to follow our hyper realized personalities in this in this kind of end of the world scenario too yeah, it's like this ongoing saga. Yes. Yeah, um, for sure. For sure. Which I think is this, fun, right? It's better than me coming out on a stage and being like, y'all right. ready for your next sketch? You know, like I didn't want to do yeah. that. I didn't right. want to do that. It would have been right. easier, but you know, mm. I didn't want to yeah. do it. Another thing I just wanted to ask you in the last minute or two here is just, you know, I was thinking um how Dr. Hadassah would be with other people in you know that kind of a black table talk setting and I was wondering <laughs> how do you think Dr. Hadassah would analyze you Robin Thede and what you do <laughs> <laughs> what would she say what would that conversation be I don't know I mean 
she already said, you know, in the opening scene in season two, she's on a Spike Lee dolly talking straight to camera. And she says, uh, what channel is this on? HBO? What's that stand for? He bought and oppressed us. Terrible name for a network. So I think for her, she would think, you know, well, why are you on this channel? You know, you should be on a channel that's run by Black people. And, you know, I don't know. She would have all sorts of conspiracies that, well, first of all, I shouldn't be working outside of the home. She wouldn't want me to be to be working outside of the home. I do wear shoes. She wouldn't enjoy that either. Um, you know, so she, she would have a lot of criticisms the same way she did for Gabrielle Union for sure. But she would like that I support, you know, black women on the show and that I lift them up. But she would encourage me to tell them to take their shoes off. As she says in season one, she's like, no, why do you have shoes on? Take your shoes off. Uh, you know, which is her ridiculous advice to women. It's, it's really silly. She, I, I truly never thought that character would take off the way she has, but I think she's one of the most recognizable characters from the show. Um, and uh, yeah, people just get a kick out of her. I think the fun thing about her too, cause I write, uh, I didn't write the first, I didn't write the first sketch of hers, but I ended up improvising everything. And then after that, I wrote all, of, I've been writing all of her sketches since. And uh, the fun thing about Dr. Hadassah is that everything out of her mouth is a joke. And most characters don't get that high joke density, but hers is a hundred percent joke density. Everything out of her mouth is a joke, which is so fun. You know, it's fun to play a character like that. Um, Chris is sort of similar. Everything out of his mouth is just kind of nonsense, but um, everything out of Dr. Hadassah's mouth is meant to be um, a joke and silly and, and, and so in her character. So I think she would think that I'm doing way too much writing. I shouldn't own a computer because that's probably, you know, the government watching me, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> But she's going to have to deal with it because yeah. I don't think she's going anywhere anytime soon. There you go. Well, this was fantastic. Uh, for those of you watching, subscribe for more interviews and head to goldderby.com to make your Emmy predictions. Robin, thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.